You're listening to the Higher Ideas Podcast, where ideas grow. Connect on Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, or higherideas.net. Now here's your host, I. Hi everybody, welcome back to the Higher Ideas Podcast. So today I thought I'd start with a little story uh, of a traveler in India. Now this traveler was in a small village and he turned the corner of a house only to find a man on the ground in front of the house uh, twisted up in a very painful looking way, uh, his legs over his head, his arms behind his back. Uh, So the the, the traveler rushed up to this man concerned and asked, uh, can I help you? And the man said, excuse me, I'm meditating. I'm doing my yoga and I've been doing this for years, do you mind? And of course, the man had to explain to the traveler about yoga and sent him on his way. So the traveler went down an alley and turned another corner, and in front of another house, again, there was a man on the ground, twisted up in an equally painful looking way. And the traveler, not to disturb him, took a photo, and as he started walking away, the man on the ground exclaimed, Hey buddy, aren't you going to help me? I just fell off my house. So... Obviously, I made that story up, but it speaks to the point today, and that is the importance of the path traveled, and also how two people arriving at the same place could be in completely different ways, just based on how they got there. See, in the one case, the yogi arrived at this crippled-looking position out of years of practice and gradual work and focus and discipline and really health, healthful behavior. And the man that fell off the roof obviously got there in a very traumatic way and without enough time to adapt, and so he's injured, he needs help. He's in a very bad way. But if you'd look at the two of them at first glance, you wouldn't know the difference until you analyze the situation a little bit more and find that one man is in pain while another man looks like he's in bliss. Now there's another case where this applies, and that is the difference between a madman and a genius. See, to most ordinary people, both probably look a little kooky. Both probably talk about things that don't seem to make sense or seem impossible, and yet we respect one and sort of cage the other. But what's the difference there? They say that uh, genius and madness are two sides of a fine line or something like that. There's all sorts of different ways it's been said, but the concept being that they're just a step away from each other. Well, I would argue that they're actually both the exact same state. It's only that one person in this state um, arrived there in a gradual and natural way, and so is able to tolerate it, while the other one probably was born there or was uh, shoved there very violently by some sort of traumatic event or tragedy and they got there in a way where they don't see the path back because they didn't travel there, they were just put there. And so they're lost, disoriented, and so of course they need help. They would be the legitimately insane. But as I said, I think they're both actually in the same place mentally. And that place is basically, when you think about it, when you think about a genius brain, it's basically a brain that is not as boxed in as their average brain. It's a brain that's more flexible, it's a brain that's able to bloom wider over itself and explore more possibilities, almost like it could fly up through Google Maps and look down on everything. Um, It's a wider sort of perception or a looser connection between areas of the brain that are able to communicate in a way that we would not really be able to do. And that creates a genius, but it's kind of the same thing for a madman. A madman has a mind that seems disorganized and it has equally illogical sounding connections, but I think his brain would probably be very similar to a genius brain. And I guess this also speaks to the importance of not making quick judgments. So that's an important lesson to think about moving forward through life, that at first glance, something that looks like an injury might actually be something very sound and very natural, such as in yoga, or a great thinker challenging us to think beyond our regular capacities about something, 
It happens in science all the time. The history of science is full of great men who thought ahead of their time and dared to pronounce some truth that seemed absolutely insane at the time. One random example is Copernicus, who was the first to suggest that we were spinning around the sun instead of the sun spinning around us. What? That's craziness! They, they persecuted that poor guy. But in the end, he was right. He was just thinking broader. He was thinking with a more flexible minds than the people who were boxed in to the ideas of the time, or wouldn't dare speak of this. In the inside, other scientists may have thought the same thing, but not dared challenge the church. So of course he would have seemed like a madman, because he dared to say it. But of course, men like him are not madmen. They're just right. They're just logical, great thinkers who dare to pronounce what they think about. But a lot of these were thrown in asylums because they were basically indistinguishable from a madman. So that's why I say I think they're actually both in the same mental place. But the importance, again, is the path traveled. In one case, a scientist, a great thinker, got to a place that seems crazy through a logical and careful gradual path, an exercise of the mind of thinking about something deeper and deeper until they got to an absurd sounding, impossible sounding, but at the same time completely plausible conclusion because they can look behind them and see the logical trail that got them there. Whereas a madman is just lost in the sea of mind. If he could touch his foot back to reality where he came from, he may also be a genius. That may be the tragedy of a genius's mind. It may be that if you get there too fast, you lose yourself. And the ones we come to respect throughout history got there gradually enough that they could make some sort of sense to us and maintain some sort of connection to regular reality. Here are some other examples where this applies. Rich people. Uh, people that work to get rich often handle the riches a lot better than someone who, say, wins the lottery or inherits money. But see, they're both in the same place again. They're both in a place of wealth. But one earned their way there through work and experience and a journey, and the other was just placed there and have no context with which to handle the value of what they have. We see this all the time with inheritors of fortunes and people who suddenly win the lottery. It always goes wrong. They never seem to be able to handle it. Same thing with uh, religion. People that have a genuine religious experience that leads them to religion often handle being religious a lot better than someone who is born into a religious family and just told what religion is and has to believe these things on on, on the word of people around them, they often turn into uh, mindless zealots that hate everyone that doesn't believe what they believe because they have deep insecurity knowing that they didn't earn the knowledge that they have. They didn't experience the knowledge that they're preaching. Whereas a person that had a real experience tends to be uh, passionate but understanding that other people probably don't need to believe along with what they're believing. All they say is, I believe it, it works for me and all I can do is try and spread the experience I had, right? There's another big difference there, and the path traveled, again, gives you the wisdom and gives you the context to handle your destination. And this even extends to, for example, founders of a country. Uh, people that fight to found a country or write a constitution would be a lot more serious about protecting it. And in generations down the line, when that constitution or that ideal of that country starts to get threatened, the people in that country tend to be lazy and tend not to defend it because they don't understand the value of where they are. They don't understand where things will go if that gets taken away. And so they just kind of let things get chipped away and don't understand any, anything else except the place of freedom and comfort that they're in. So they're a lot less quick and a lot less vigilant to protect the state they've gotten to through a lot of effort of these ancestors. So as you can see, traveling a path to a final destination not only makes you more able to handle the destination, but also makes you a stronger and more balanced person. And it's an important thing to remember that in all these cases, it's hard to tell the difference between the two. So you have to take your time, you have to listen to people, and ask them what path they've traveled to get to where they are. That's a good way to figure out if they're uh, in a stable condition or not.
So let's remember that. Let's remember the difference. The importance of the path traveled, but also that in both cases in that story, the traveler was wrong. He made an assumption and was wrong. He thought the yogi was injured, and he also thought the injured man was a yogi. Don't be so quick to judge. Take your time and investigate. And one final offshoot off this lesson and this story, life overall, the experience of life, is also all about the path traveled. And we're all going to the same place in the end. The important thing is the path traveled. It's how you get there. What paths you take is what shapes you and makes you a person. So choose your paths well. And be conscious of which path you're on. Because this has everything to do with what state you'll be in when you get to the other end. See you next time.